Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak at the Advanced Photonics Techniques in Biology Conference, uh, hosted by the Institute of Physics. My name is Daniel Hahn, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Manchester. Today I'll be talking to you about the specific application of simple neural networks to analyse and interpret trajectories taken from microscopy experiments of fluorescent vesicles inside the cell. As you've guessed, my PhD is an interdisciplinary endeavour involving both biology and mathematics. And linking the two, there is a significant amount of data analysis and quantification that needs to go in in order to verify mathematical models with biology experiments and vice versa. To begin with, I will introduce the biological context of the experiments and then move on to how we can describe this with mathematical models. And finally, of course, I'll show how we can use neural networks, simple neural networks, to expedite the process of data analysis and also discover new techniques that weren't previously possible with the current existing statistical methods. So here, what you see is a biological experiment showing rab 5 vesicles, endosomes, that are shown with these red dots, traveling along these green lines, microtubules, uh, to the centrosome where the microtubule organizing center is. And these endosomes are known to attach to motor proteins such as kinesins or dyanines that walk along these microtubules uh, in a directed manner. And our goal will be to quantify how these endosomes move along these microtubules and how they're transported. It turns out that there exists mathematical formalism that can describe the motion of these endosomes quite well. And this is called anomalous diffusion. Anomalous diffusion is fully characterized by the mean square displacement being proportional to time to the power of alpha, where alpha is the anomalous exponent. Alpha equals one corresponds to pure diffusion. Alpha less than one corresponds to subdiffusion, and alpha greater than one corresponds to superdiffusion. Below each of the values, I've shown a qualitative plot of what the motion of a particle moving in two dimensions would look like for each of these values. And of course, we can begin measuring the anomalous exponent using experimental trajectories. So consider a trajectory below here that has positions x1, x2, x3, and so on, each with corresponding times t1, t2, and t3. We can explicitly calculate the mean square displacement using this formula here by using a lag time. So this is what's commonly called a time-averaged MSD uh, with, as a function of lag time. And this time-averaged MSD should obey the same properties that we had before. So lag time to the power of alpha, where alpha is the anomalous exponent. And using this relationship, we can then start to plot the time average MSD values for the whole trajectory on a plot of mean time average MSD versus lag time. And from this, we can fit the relationship, the power law relationship, t to the power of alpha, and then obtain the value of alpha. And there is a problem. These statistical methods, such as looking at the relationship between time average MSDs and the relationship between them and the lag time, often require large numbers of sample trajectories. So not only do you need many, many trajectories, many individual realizations, but also you need many, many points. So you need to be able to sample one trajectory uh, significantly well, such that this n value here becomes very, very large. Not only this, but also the time average MSDs and most statistical methods assume that this anomalous exponent doesn't change over the period of the trajectory. And that's exactly why we can take this average over lag times, because we're assuming that the behavior exhibited all throughout the track is essentially the same. Here are some example trajectories of real intracellular RAB5 endosomes moving in the cell. So each of these dots I'm sure you can see, they exhibit a variety of complex behaviors. They stop and start, they wiggle about, and they change direction. Let's play that again. 
And from these stills, what you can see, this is a phase contrast image, and this is another fluorescent image of RAD5 enzymes. The stills and the video show that we can't assume each of these trajectories have a single anomalous exponent that we can characterize, nor can we assume that at different scales they have different anomalous exponents. We have to assume that at every single point in each one of these trajectories here, there is a different behavior being exhibited. And that's precisely how we come to the measurement paradox. Okay, so let's assume that we have the same trajectory as we had before with each of these points. But the behavior, the state that the trajectory is in, is determined by the color here. So there's one state, the second state, the third state, and so on. How are we to interpret these states, these state changes? How can we segment these points such that we capture these different states? And with current statistical approaches, this is an impossibility. One, because we can't start taking averages anymore. And two, because we might not have a very, very large sample of a single state. And this is exactly where neural networks come in. Neural networks are very, very good at recognizing patterns and classifying them. And so instead of going down this traditional route of data analysis, what we'll do is we'll go through neural networks to analyze the trajectories that are taken from biology experiments. And the way we can do this is the following. We pose the question, can we train a supervised neural network on a mathematical model that will give us the anomalous exponent of these different states with a very, very small number of points. So in other words, can a neural network pick up from a small selection of points, um, let's say x5 and x6, for example, can the neural network detect, only given x5 and x6, that the anomalous exponent at this point is alpha 5? And of course, the most important question when training a supervised neural network is what it will be your training data and training labels. So what will be the underlying mathematical model? And this is what we have to think very, very carefully about which process describes uh, the endosome movement the best. So consider the microscopic picture for different random walks. When we have velocity random walks, what we mean by that is we have random walks that choose a direction and draw a time, a random time, out of a probability density function and travel in that direction for that amount of time with a given velocity. It could be a random velocity too. In the microscopic picture, velocity random walks are actually ballistic. In other words, if you took a point that was smaller than the random time drawn from your time distribution, if you took two points in between the traveling times, you would end up with a result that this particle knows exactly where it's going and is traveling with a constant velocity in one direction. On the other hand, we have jump processes, which are most commonly represented by continuous time random walks. Continuous time random walks, if you take the microscopic picture, are mostly stationary with an instantaneous jump at a given time, and they too just like velocity random walks, draw random times out of a distribution, wait at a certain position, and then instantaneously jump to another position, governed by a transition probability matrix. Given these two models have very, very contrasting properties for the microscopic scale, so velocity random walks represent ballistic motion in one direction, whereas jump processes represent completely stationary motion and then an instantaneous infinite velocity jump. We can safely say that maybe these two models might not represent the best training data that we can simulate to put into our neural network. So here comes the question. This is a picture here of sample trajectories from experimental data. And when you consider each individual trajectory, none of them are really traveling with a single velocity uh, ballistically. There's always variations within a single unidirectional run. And also, 
when they are not traveling, they are rarely ever completely stationary. And it almost looks like it could be characterized by Brownian motion. And this is where we get to fractional Brownian motion. So in the 1960s, the late 1960s, Mandelbrot and Van Ness developed this notion called the fractional Brownian motion. And it is characterized fully by H, the Hurst exponent, which is related to the anomalous exponent being 2 times H. What we mean by multifractional Brownian motion is that within one trajectory, as you can see here, H can change values as time progresses. And this leads to a trajectory that has varying degrees of behavior. The good thing about using multifractional Brownian motion is that qualitatively it looks very, very similar to that of real trajectories. And quantitatively, it's never completely stationary, nor is it completely ballistic at any point. And so it seems to fit our criteria on how qualitatively to model the movement of endosomes inside cells. Before we continue, however, we should train the neural network on sample trajectories of multifractional Brownian motion and also singular fractional Brownian motion and test whether the neural network is actually performing the way we want it to perform. On top of this, we should actually test whether current statistical methods using a windowed approach is actually better performing than the neural network or not. So here we have comparisons of the accuracy of the neural network in estimating the Hurst exponent in this last column versus other statistical techniques such as sequential range analysis, mean square displacements, and rescaled range analysis. What you see on the y-axis of the first row and the second row are the estimated Hurst exponent values, and what you see in the third and fourth row are the difference between the estimated Hurst exponent values and the simulated Hurst exponent values. The x-axis of each of the columns shows the simulated Hurst exponent values. So in essence, this is our ground truth label, and this will be our training and test labels that our machine learning algorithm has generated. The first and second rows show that there is a quite a, a non-uniform estimation error for all the other statistical techniques, whereas for the neural network, it's relatively stable. The second row is simply a Gaussian kernel estimation of the points above. And each one of these points represents one experiment. So one trajectory uh, estimated Hurst exponent versus that trajectory's simulated Hurst exponent. The bottom two rows shows along the red line, which would be a perfect estimate, how much spread there is between uh, the estimated Hurst exponent and the simulated Hurst exponents. And we can see even with uh, the values of mean absolute error, sigma h, that the value for the neural network is much, much lower than all the other methods. These points, so each one of these points, which represents a trajectory that was tested, was a hundred time points in length. In other words, there was a hundred points that we could average over for the MSD, and a hundred points to input into the neural network. On the right here, what we have is a multi-fractional uh, Brownian motion simulation. So here you can see the trajectory's value. And on the bottom here, we can see the value of the simulated Hurst exponent, which is shown by the purple thick line, and the estimated Hurst exponent using a window uh, by the neural network. So the black line represents the estimation of the Hurst exponent using the neural network. And the window size here was 14 points. And we can see it does a relatively good job of uh, estimating the Hurst exponent. Now let's explore different neural network architectures and how they perform uh, quantitatively compared to the statistical methods for shorter trajectories. So here we have three different neural network architectures that we tested. And this, will, this is just a simple deep learning feed forward neural network. So the first case is we have five input points, in other words, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. 
and they go into nodes that are uh, subsequently more numerous in each hidden layer. And so at the very end, uh, it estimates a Hertz exponent with this single neuron. That's the anti-triangular structure. This is the triangular structure, and this is the rectangular structure. Now, if we compare the mean absolute error versus the number of time points in the trajectory, we can see that the neural network is far more accurate, on average, at estimating the Hurst exponent. This error is much, much lower than all the other statistical methods. And most of the statistical methods show that the, va the value of the error is decreasing as we supply it more points. And this is exactly what I was talking about with um, methods of averaging. So the more points you have, the more averaging you can do, and the more accurate your estimation becomes. Moreover, what's interesting is that the number of uh, neural network nodes in each deep learning layer doesn't seem to affect the accuracy of the estimation of Hurst exponents. And we can see this is true for both the number of time points varying or the number of hidden layers that vary. So in fact, our neural network, that uh, the structure that we're going to use is triangular because this will require the least number of parameters to be trained. And now we can apply this neural network estimation to real trajectories. That's exactly what you see here. This is a real trajectory of a RAB5 uh, vesicle inside a cell. And what we do is we take its displacement away from its original position. And when we do that, we see that the areas highlighted in green, which represent uh, when the estimation of the Hurst exponent is greater than 0 0.55, is considered active. And we can see it lines up very, very well with regions of the velocity, the windowed velocity, that is non-zero. So this would mean that the particle is active in terms of a velocity state, but also we can see in terms of persistence and anti-persistence and Hurst exponents, this region is also marked um, active. Same with these long unidirectional flights with occasional switches. Um, you can see from the velocity plot that these green regions highlight where the particle has a non-zero uh, velocity. You can also see that when the particle is just uh, sub-diffusing in the cytoplasm, the Hurst exponent estimation has also picked that up. And you can also see from the diagram here that most of the regions with long directional flights uh, are picked up by the neural network as green sections, and those that are almost stationary or trapped, confined in a certain space, is picked up by purple regions. We use these values of upper and lower bounds because we know that the error of our estimation is at least 0 0.05, calculated from before from the mean absolute error. And by doing this for one trajectory, we gain a qualitative picture of how a, how a trajectory moves in terms of um, diffusive, diffusive uh, persistent and anti-persistent states. However, by comparing multiple trajectories, many hundreds of thousands of trajectories, what we can do is we can actually start to quantify the characteristics of persistent motion of certain different comp protein complexes. Okay, so on the left here, you see histograms of possible Hurst exponents obtained from thousands of trajectories that we've tracked and measured using our neural network. Each of these three lines represents a different experiment. The thin green line represents an experiment involving lysosomes in cells and how they move. The thick black line represents uh, fluorescing RAB5 endosomes. And the magenta line here that you see represents fluorescing SNCs1 tagged endosomes that are moving within cells. And what we notice is there is a striking difference between how RAB5 and lysosomes move versus how SNCs1 tagged endosomes move. And this is markedly different in the subdiffusive regime of the movement, with also a slight difference in the superdiffusive regime. So we're going to now call these states anti-persistent and persistent because subdiffusive and superdiffusive are inherently um, 
average related terms. And also what we can do is we can measure the survival times of these anti-persistent and persistent states. And what we find is all of the distributions all, from all three experiments match quite well a truncated power law survival. Moreover, what we see is that for each of the experiments, anti-persistent times are much, much longer than the persistent times. What this means is that probabilistically, your endosomes and lysosomes will spend a longer time not moving in a persistent manner and then have short bursts of persistent movement. And again, there is a striking difference in these survival, survival times between SNCs1 and RAV5 with lysosomes in the sense that the anti-persistent time and the persistent times are far closer together than the RAV5 and lysosomes. And in this way, we can begin to siphon out different characteristics of different particles, um, different protein complexes that may have different functions biologically. So where to from here? Well, we can perform further experiments involving different proteins associated with different functions of transport. Then we can do experiments to discern why the motility is different. What makes the motility different? Do different protein complexes and adapter proteins that may be on the surface of these endosomes attach to different dining motors or different kinase motors? And thirdly, of course, we can improve the neural network structure to estimate the anomalous exponent. And by doing so, we might engage in modern, more modern techniques such as recurrent neural networks or uh, convolution neural networks. One possible explanation for why the SNCs1 motility is so different to that of RAV5 and lysosomes can be found in the confocal imaging of where these particles localize on bigger endosomes. And what we see is that the SNCs1 particles are usually on the outside of these endosomes. So these, this green kind of ring here, these green rings, are the main endosome bodies. And we can see that the SNCs1 actually localize on the surface of these endosomes, which might explain why they're less anti-persistent than RAV5. Obviously, if you have a small attachment on the surface of something, you're more likely to be able to move. Whereas if you're a big body, um, that's difficult to move and can only move through cooperative motor transport, it might be harder for you to, to begin moving in a persistent manner. This is just one of our hypotheses that is in line with what we found using our neural network. So thank you very much for listening to my talk today. And I'd just like to acknowledge all of the co-authors that have worked with me and, and taught me many, many things. So this is my supervisor, Professor Sergei Fedotov from Mathematics, Professor Victoria Allen from Biology, and Dr. Thomas Way from Biophysics, um, who both helped me with experiments and analysis. Dr. Nikolai Korobel, who is a, a postdoctoral researcher in mathematics also. Dr. Mark Johnston in biology, Anna Gavrilova in biology, and Rinza Chen in computer science. And for further reading on this material that I've presented today, our work has actually been recently published in eLife, so feel free to go and search it there. Thank you.